It's scary to make any kind of real investment. Grow, scale, become more and more owner independent. Doing the actual business, all of a sudden your marketing's working really well and you get so busy. So yes, I do want baseline marketing systems. That's critical. You manage me, I work for you. That's not, for a middle stage level two business, that's not the first place to go. Maui Mastermind presents the Business Coach Podcast, answering your questions and providing real actionable insights for building a better, stronger, more profitable business without sacrificing your time, life, or freedom anymore. Welcome to episode number five of The Business Coach. In this episode, we're actually going to do a special double episode. We're going to be doing five and six, these two episodes back to back. I'm going to record them here. And what we're going to be talking about is how can you take control of your marketing so that you're actually getting results. I hear this all the time from clients. And, and, and so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to build a case study here by looking at two clients of ours that we're coaching through this very situation. And I want to save you time in this podcast. I always want to save you time. So how do you know if this is right for you? This episode is right for you if you've ever been frustrated that in your business you have too few leads. Like you have more capacity, but you need more business coming in the door. Or maybe you have what we call feast or famine where things go really well and then you get distracted and then they start, stop working in the marketing. This episode is for you or these two episodes are for you. If you've ever felt that you've been in the dark around your marketing about is it working or not working? What's working? Why is it working? It, it feels like your marketing is in this black box and you wish you could open up the black box and actually understand what's going on so that you could actually actively make it work better versus just passively pray and hope. And this episode and the next is for you if you've ever wished you knew how to best manage and leverage third-party outside marketing vendors, whether that be an SEO company or a pay-per-click firm that you're working with or someone who's running uh, your direct mail campaigns or some other aspect of what you're doing. If you've ever felt like they promised you the world and then delivered you less than the moon, <laughs> you know, it's frustrating. Well, this we're going to talk with you in these two episodes about how to have that not be the case, how you can get them to deliver what's promised and how you can get their best performance. Now, as we go through and do this here, I'm going to do it through the use of two case studies. So where this comes from, um, at this stage, coaching wise, you know, our coaching staff are fantastic. The Maui coaches work with hundreds of businesses um, every month to help them grow, scale, become more and more owner independent. I get the opportunity as the owner of the company to jump in here or to jump in there. Sometimes it's a client that I just have a, a really important relationship with or sometimes someone just asks a really interesting question. So we had two emails that came in from two different clients and I want to go through, set this up so that this is what we're going to be focusing on. Um, the first email came through from Brian. Now Brian runs a medical practice and in his medical practice it's more procedure based. Okay, he's an incredibly bright guy. He's very analytic, very smart. But he's also one of those people that left to his own for years before doing this work. Um, he would just focus in on his practice as he's a practitioner doing his practice. A prototypical level two middle stage company. And Brian came into something, I'm sure you guys will recognize the, the terminology as soon as I write it on here. We call it feast or famine. And what it is, it's the cycle that all of a sudden your marketing's working really well and you get so busy doing the actual business, producing your product or your service to take care of it, that all of a sudden you stop doing the things that made it work so well. And now you have famine. And then all of a sudden you put energy back into your marketing and it goes up again. And then you have a cycle of it going up and down. And the problem with that is when that cycle goes up and down, three things occur. Number one, you the business owner start getting a little bit anxious about your cash flow. And because of that, you make short-term decisions versus smarter, longer-term strategic moves in the business. When your cash flow is inconsistent, it's scary to make any kind of real investment. Now, I'm not talking about putting thousands or hundreds of thousands or million dollars in the business, because this is typically what happens at the level two middle stage. Remember, three stages of business, right? We've got level one, a startup. We've got level two, early stage, level two, middle stage, and level two, advanced. 
These lead eventually into level three. And level three, and I'll describe what these all are in here in one second, just to make sure we're all on the same page. So a level one business startup, you know, you've got no control, no freedom. You don't even have any revenue, really. Level two early, you're starting to get sales. Those early sales, you're making, you're out there making it work. But you still haven't reached the point of profitability. Your business is still at risk. At a middle stage level two, you have it. A business that's profitable, but a business that revolves around you. It's a prototypical owner-reliant company. And then you've got a business that starts to get to build beyond just that owner. And you start having leaders and other key pillars of the business. And now you have a business that's starting to be really what we call a rapid growth company. When you look at the departments of your, your company, the pillars as we call them, sales, marketing, operations, finance, HR, executive leadership, one or more of those is led by somebody else. And the person who's leading them, what that means is you start to have a business that's getting beyond just the owner. It's still not a, an owner independent company, but it's starting to. It's starting to. And then a level three business truly is an owner independent business. The owner may or may not still work in the business, depending what he or she likes to do or what their goals and ambitions are, but the business no longer requires them. And now you have what is truly an exit stage company, a company that can be sold for tens of millions of dollars, a company that can be owned more passively or even fully passively, providing millions of dollars of cash flow and still doing good work in the world. And then a level three business also could be something that you could stay in and actively work because you enjoy it so much, right? I, I would put myself in that category. So coming through here, Brian, in, this, in our case study here, he's a middle stage business owner. And middle stage businesses, it happens all the time. They do some marketing, business development, and then they get so busy taking care of the business, they stop and the business dies. We talked about the three things that causes. Number one, anxiety for the owner so they make shorter term decisions about where to place time, mostly, and attention of them and their other key people. And because of that, the business stays small. They never explode beyond this. Um, feast or famine cycle. The second thing that this causes is it makes it really rough on the team. There are periods where they're scrambling to get everything done and then there are periods where they're anxious because it seems like they don't have enough work to do. So it causes anxiety in your team and that actually chases away your best people. You lose your best people because of that lack of consistency and that overwhelming stress and then the stress goes away and now it's anxiety over where, where, what do we do? Are we going to be okay? The third thing that this does is it traps the business because that inconsistency means that the business itself never builds momentum. They build momentum, then lose it. Build momentum, and then lose it. It's kind of like a dieter who goes on and loses 15 pounds, regains it all back. Loses 15 pounds, regains it all back. It's just this yo-yo, and it's really emotionally stressful. So that's the first case study we're going to talk through. How, what was the advice that I gave to Brian to help him break out of feast or famine? And to do that knowing that he doesn't have a lot of marketing resources. Matter of fact, he doesn't even need that. And we'll come into that in a moment. The second case study we're going to go through in the next podcast, just to tell you about the series that's coming on here, and that will be dropped next week. Um, in episode six, I've got a, another client of ours that had a really interesting situation. He's a, he's a great guy. His name's Bob. Bob owns a contracting business. Now, he, he bought that business of, you know, about, what, about eight, nine years ago um, after a full career as a CPA in, in public accounting for a large, a large accounting firm. Really bright guy, very nice, salt of the earth, really nice man. His challenge with the market is he sees that for him to go where he wants to go, he's now an advanced stage level two business. He's rapidly growing. Matter of fact, uh, over the last four and a half, five years since we started working with him, he's gone and basically 10X'd his company. You can imagine that. And it might even be less than that. It might even be over the last three and a half years. I, I don't have that number right in front of me. But now he's at the point where he recognizes he needs more and better marketing help than he currently has. And so how do you leverage outside marketing help such that you get their best work and not just empty promises? And that's what we'll go into next after that. So let's start here first with Brian, our feast and famine person here. Um, think about him if you run a professional services firm or you're a service-based business, or even if you're a manufacturer. It, all this apply. This is a really a perfect case study for someone who is what I'll call a level two, middle stage company. This is truly what we would call the prototypical owner reliant company. So for this company, what do we do there? The first thing I want to point out here, and it's really interesting, 
is that Brian brought this up himself. He said, I've never taken the time, I'm paraphrasing, to step out of the business long enough to figure out what of our marketing actually is bringing in the right types of business. Now, in his world, he'll call them patients. Um, I'm going to call them customers because <laughs> um, now it'll apply. I'm going to generalize this out to many different kinds of businesses. So think about it. I might have in my marketing, I might have tactic one, tactic two, tactic three, and I might even have four, five, and six. The first challenge that a middle stage level two business has is they have no tracking in place to even know where their, where their customers are coming from. I see it all the time. Or if they have tracking, it's woefully inaccurate. You know, it's, it's a self-reported tracking. Someone shows up at the front counter to check in at the practice and the woman behind the desk says, oh, welcome here, Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones, how did you find us? And she says, um, you know, if someone told you about it, well, who? You know, it was a neighbor. Well, what Mrs. Jones mistakenly said that was because it was actually her general practitioner referred her over. So self-report information for tracking is though, it's better than nothing. By far, it is better than nothing. But self-reported information is notoriously inaccurate. So what you want to do is you want to be able to track the behavior so that you get what's called an embedded control. You can track it differently. So here's some ways that can go about doing that. You know, for example, it's, well, I'm going to make this up. We're going to, again, we're going to use the medical practice, but you can generalize this to other businesses as well. All right. So for the tactics you have for, for, for tactic one, we're going to call this professional referrers. Now, if you were uh, an attorney, professional referrers would be CPAs that refer to you or financial planners that refer to you or um, uh, insurance people that refer to you or, in this case for medical, professional referrers, if you're a specialty surgeon, as Brian is, his professional referrers are the other um, practice, more the general, other doctors in the, in, the, in the medical community, probably the general practitioners or other specialists that when something comes up and know, they know it's your expertise, they say, oh, you should see Dr. Brian, right? That's who you should go see. He's really good. So professional referrers is one of his tactics uh, or one of his strategies with that. Another one of his strategies, I'm going to, you know, I, I'm going to make this stuff up here, could be that he's got ads in certain publications, right? And so this might be in a local lifestyle magazine or in a local paper. So the ads would be the next one here. So print ads um, would be another example of a potential tactic that you might have that we're going to use in our case study here. And then we're going to go one more tactic just to kind of round this through. And perhaps, um, in this case, it might be we'll call just SEO and organic traffic coming through their website. Okay, so now the problem is is that right now Brian doesn't know which is working. He's never really thought through that part. And as he goes to do an analysis, what he might discover is that his tracking is really off. And by the way, that's good news. You say, David, how could that possibly be good news? I mean, isn't that horrible that if Brian's tracking is off? Um, well, hang on a second here. If his tracking is off or it just it's woefully underdone, Think about it. He's already he's done a good job creating a business that's profitable. And he's done it without having good tracking, which means that when we fix his tracking together, that his business is going to be even better. So I know a lot of times I'll talk with a, a client and I'm coaching with them and their first reaction is, dang it, you know, this really frustrates me. How could we have done it this way wrong all these years? For example, how could we have been tracking or not tracking our marketing? You say that it's obvious. I know I should have done it. I beat myself up on it, but just note that that's a good thing. And it's a good thing because you've already built, you know, a certain level of success. You built a certain level of success and you've reached this. And so once we fix your tracking, you've done that without tracking. Once we fix that, oh my gosh, you're going to be able to go much, much further and have the business be even better once we fix that. So don't be don't be down on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Say, oh, David, I should have known better. I should have done better. Look, you're, you're going to have this ups and downs in your business no matter what. So the first thing we need Brian to do is to step back and to look at, and, 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 and so let's, say, let's pretend that Brian hasn't tracked anything. Okay. So if he hasn't tracked anything, he needs to sit down and think, what are the ways people find us? And he's going to, he might not even know what, what they are. For example, his SEO it might be a totally passive thing with no effort on the website to do that, right? He might have put no energy in on that. And if that is the case, he can at least list the tactic. Okay, organic SEO, hmm. 
And then I do know that we run ads, although I'm not sure what it is. I, you know, our front desk has been asking for a while, but it's all self-reported. So he's going to pull up, and, and again, I'm going to make some stuff up. He's going to grab old data. He's going to say that we've had, you know, a thousand patients over the last two years. Okay, thousand patients over the last two years, and of those thousand patients over the last two years, oops, go back to his camera. Um, over the thousand patients in the last two years, he might say my best, the best I can tell, is that of those we had probably somewhere between four and five hundred seem to come through from professional referrers. He might find out that, as best he can tell, somewhere around about a hundred came through from the ads that he's published, and the balance of that seems to be um, coming through from this way. So somewhere around about 300 or 400, and I'll, well, actually we'll put this here, around 300 to 400 seem to come through from his, just his website. Gra again, he doesn't have great tracking. So his first action step was to lay out what were the tactics. Second action step was to do his best to say what, if I look back at a historic period, what's my baseline number of leads from each of these sources? And as he does that, a couple things become clear. Number one, he'll find that probably he's not tracking certain ways. So now he's going to get better about training the front desk folks. In this case, he'll have his practice manager train the front desk people to always ask. Remember, a self-report is better than nothing, but, but we're going to see some other better ways. Number two, he's going to get with a website person, not him, his practice manager, and they're going to put tracking on the website such that when someone inquires from the website and they, they, there's something that they can fill in information to, to set up an appointment and or to, um, to, to get in contact with the office, the office is going to track that better if they get an email from the website by having a separate email on the website. They can tell from that part for new patient inquiries and or if it gets scheduled off the website. He's going to even try to put you know, a little bit of a, the equivalent of a cookie, right? Um, the little the tracking information so that if they come back later on, he has a better shot of cleaning up the tracking. So it won't ever be perfect, but it will be better. Now the ads, what he realizes is he's had his ads just go to his main website. So he doesn't know if these hundred, he, he thinks they're from the ads, but he, these two are very muddled together simply because he had the ad just go straight to his homepage. And so by thinking about this, he's going to now change that. He's going to have it go from drbrian.com. He's going to now put the ads in there. It might be drbrian.com forward slash new patient or forward slash health or some other way to track that those are people when they get to the website. Again, they're tracked so we can differentiate between just the organic traffic and the paid portion that he has. You don't have to be an expert with this, but uh, any reasonably good marketing web person can, in fact, set that up with and for you. We'll talk more about how to get the best out of third-party vendors on the next episode, episode six next week. But for right now, just note that that is absolutely doable. And so let's go back to our part here. And so now we look at here's where the leads came in, the patients came in. That's a good starting point. It's not enough, but that's a really good starting point. Remember. As an owner-reliant, middle-stage level two business, your biggest constraint, by far, your biggest constraint is you, the owner of the business, is your best time and attention. That's your big constraint. Generally, a middle-stage level two business owner is so busy in production that they just don't have time to focus on the business as a business. And that's what holds them back. So, just like with Brian, remember episode two, I believe it was, of the podcast, we talked about the time value matrix, creating your focus blocks of time. That's exactly what we coach Brian to do, and now he's taking um, focus time. And by the way, it's starting to work with him from that part. He's gone from five days a week working in his business, making a certain amount of money, to making a little bit more money, but working four days a week. That's a real improvement. That's a 20 plus percent improvement. That's a big deal, right? Celebrate those wins. But coming back to for Brian, now we're going to look at saying, okay, well, hang on. It's good to know that we've had a certain number of leads from much of these places, but how good were those leads? How good are these patients? What I look at it is, so how profitable were the leads that came from each of these sources? And the way we're going to look at it, here's the gold standard. I'm going to give you the gold standard. And then I'm going to give you an easy workaround if it's over your head. <laughs> so the gold standard way to tell how good your lead sources are is to actually put down what's your gross profit margin for each of these tactics. So for patients that come in from tactic one, from professional referrers, 
what's the average gross profit margin per each of those patients? So here's a way to think about that. Gross profit margin, just I'm going to give you a quick little cue on this in case you don't remember. If we take our total revenue, subtract off the cost of goods sold, which means the cost of producing our product or service and delivering it, what we're left with is our gross profit, profit before all the other expenses. Just the expenses of delivering, producing and delivering our product or service. So in a medical practice, it would be the total revenue, let's say it was $3,000 for the procedure, less the um, $700 of anesthesia and the uh, OR cost of $1,200. And what we're left with is, you come up with your own number there, right? So the direct cost of producing that, that offering. Your gross profit margin is simply your gross profit relative to your total revenue as a percent. So what this means is if we, we might discover that in our example here, that as professional referrers have on average a gross profit of, I'll make up a number here, of uh, 70%. Whereas the ad folks might have a gross profit of this one here of uh, 62%. And his SEO organic might have a 65%. Again, I'm making these numbers up. But what it does is it tells us that this top tactic is more profitable for him and deserves more attention. If this numbers were reversed and this was the lowest gross profit and this was the highest, it tells you that more energy in his website would be a good thing. Because it's not just about the leads, it's about how qualified are those leads, how profitable are those leads. The gold standard is to be able to connect back that the leads that came in from this tactic, what's the average gross profit? How do I figure that out? It's easy. It, it really is easy. I take the total amount of revenue generated by these professional referrers. Again, I'm going to make this part up. This would say this is $1.5 million of revenue that came in from professional referrers' patients, these, these four or 500 patients. And then I take out or subtract the direct cost of producing my product or service for these people. Again, I don't know what the number is going to be. Let's make that up and call that, uh, well, let's make it easy for ourselves, 500,000. Let's make my math really easy. That tells me that I've got a gross profit of $1 million, which is a 66.7% gross profit margin, right? If I take $1 million divided by the 1.5, that gives me 66.7%. Seven, right? Six, 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 all the way with that part. We just rounded it off. 66.7. There we go. So I can do that for each of these tactics. Now, to do that for each of these is going to be either easy or hard, depending how your financials are set up. So if you can approximate it, that's helpful. One way to approximate it would simply be um, to look at if you think that the cost of producing for each of these three are the same, then we can simplify it. We can actually simplify it. If you think, David, it, it doesn't cost me any more to actually produce my product or service based on the customer. They're all buying the same thing. Then I can simply make it even easier. I can look at the average sale per client or customer for each of these lead sources. And so if this one had an average sale of, I'm going to make up the number here, of $4,000, this one had $3,000. And this one had $2,500 per, per, you know, per sale for these different sources. We know that the professional referrers are better than that. So again, I can simplify. I'm trying to give you my insider tips. Then this is what I've learned coaching lots of businesses. Um, there are ways to shortcut the analysis. You don't have to make it so difficult. So if the production of your product or service is similar cost-wise across your different types of clients or customers, then you can just look at the revenue side. But if the types of things they're buying are different based on which lead source they're coming in, then we should be looking at the, the actual gross profit per lead on these different parts or the gross profit margin for each of these sources. That's a simpler way to go. There's one more way to simplify. I want to give you the, the way to simplify if you have no clue about your own financials. By the way, if you don't have a clue about your financials, please, let's get you educated about it. Maybe in some of the future podcasts, I'll talk about it something we work with, with clients all the time on uh, that are coaching clients. But let's just do this here to make it even simpler. I can just do my best estimate, one to five. What's my best guesstimate, my best intuition about how profitable these types of clients are? And one way to go is I can look at 
you know, I can look at 20, 30, 40 of my, each of these types of patient types or client types and think, hmm, based on what I'm seeing here, you know, I, I might say these people are about a, a four out of five. These people are about a, a two out of five. And these people are actually probably four or five out of five. And so what it does is it gives you a way to take something that is very um, fuzzy and give a little bit more precision to it just by asking for a number one to five. It's not nearly as good as measuring the actual metrics, but it's a way to start. In the second episode in the series, I'm going to give you a, a, a way of tracking your marketing and what the key metrics will be, um, including the one number that's going to be probably the most important number for you. And I'll, I'll give you a kind of a grid, a matrix for what that looks like. But I want to keep it simple. For my level two middle stage business owners, this is enough. It really is to make you, to, to give you the next step of growth that you can do. For my advanced stage level two, this is a good background. When we get to the next episode, I'll give you the more advanced. For my middle stage folks, you can listen to the more advanced, but I don't want you to freak out over it. Middle stage level two people generally don't have the, the staff support and the business sophistication just yet to do all these things. Some do. We've got some, some middle stage level two coaching clients that come to us and they've got great tracking in place. They've already done the stuff for the advanced. They just happen to have other issues that they came to us to help solve. But for the moment, this is enough. So what's now, based on all these things I've just shared with you, what you've been able to do is you've been able to determine which lead sources are better than other lead sources. We call this picking your winners and, 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 and your losers. And that's important, and it's an important principle here. So we want to feed your winners and starve your losers. But in order for us to feed your winners and starve your losers, we've got to know which, in fact, are your winners and which, in fact, are your losers. Without that knowledge, we can't do that. So let's come back here. Let's pretend, again, in our example, let's pretend that this is clearly a loser. The publication ads that you're doing just really don't bring very many patients, and the patients they bring tend to be lower profit patients than others. You know, generally speaking, in a medical practice, what that would mean is they tend to bring certain types of procedures or types of patients that get reimbursed for things very low, or they attract certain types of insurance payers um, where you know, these people might all be Medicare folks, which pay very low relative to your Blue Crosses and your Anthems and your other contracts. Um, so those are possibilities. Um, what might this look like in a, in a construction business, right? These might be your customers that come and say, hey, we want you just to, to, to fix our back porch versus your leads from some other source might be people who say, hey, we want you to do a complete remodel of the house or a complete brand new build, right? So if that's your loser, and we look through this here and we find that of all these different things here in our example here, which is pretend, let's pretend that our winner was this one, the professional referrers. That by far these were our best cases, our most profitable patients, and also we got the most. And then you say, David, what about this one here with the SEO organic? We say this was kind of a, we'll call this in the middle. Oops, two Ds, middle. So most people, what they do is they try to fix a loser which is a complete waste of time. That's not, for a middle stage level two business, that's not the first place to go. The first place to go is to say, okay, we were spending here, it wouldn't be uncommon for, for a middle stage level two in their advertising to be spending 30, 40,000, $50,000 a year in the marketing. We're gonna stop doing that. Um, and we're gonna reinvest that money into our professional referrers and more profit. <laughs> uh, one of the construction, I'll give an example. One of the construction companies we work with, um, they were doing about half a million dollars a year in pay-per-click. But when we had them do this analysis, they, what we discovered was they were actually losing money on every pay-per-click customer that came to them. It was crazy. When we challenged them on this, the first thought was, well, our pay-per-click drives all of our other marketing. We said, well, let's, let's test that. You think that's true, let's test that. Let's spend less on your pay-per-click and if it doesn't affect your other marketing, if your other marketing stays strong, then the money you save by spending less it goes straight to your bottom line profit. And so they cut their half a million dollars to a quarter of a million dollars in advertising over the course of several months, only to discover it made no difference to their other sales channels. And what that meant was an extra quarter of a million dollars straight to their bottom line. How many of you would like that? I mean, I think that's pretty good. And then what we discovered was that one of their other marketing tactics was actually really good for them. It was a direct mail. We invested more in their direct mail, about another 100, 200,000. They kept the extra 50 or 100 in profit because they didn't 
they, as they cut back even more on their pay-per-click, it saved them even more. Some of the savings they put into their direct mail, their business grew by over $2 million from 5 to $7 million by doing that tactic, right? From doing that. So this stuff makes a difference. So don't try to fix your losers. What do we do? We starve our losers. We stop putting time, attention, and money on our losers. Done. Don't throw good money after bad. And we say, how can we scale up or reinvest in our winners? So for Brian, that might be like, for example, it's very common in the medical world that a specialist doctor builds goodwill in a community and, and becomes known through doing things like lunch and learns that are set up or having a, they call it a, a many times they'll call it a, a, a practice liaison who her responsibility is to go out to the different practices in the community to build relationships with the other practices that are in their professional referral network, right? To the, in this case, it might be to the family practices or to, based on his specialty, it might be to some of the practices that specialize in working with older patients or um, with athletes or you can go, the list goes on with that. So that's where I would put the money. And by doing that, you might find that you can take your four or 500 and over the course of two years, three years, that might now be 800 to 1,000. And now you might lose all of these 100, so you, but you're, you have more leads coming in. And here's the best part, they're more profitable. I don't want you just to have to work really hard in your business. That's, that's what an owner-reliant level two person without any coaching does. They just put their head down and work. My business is simply to support my family. I work, I work, I work, I work, I retire. I have 5, 10, 15 years, and then I die. Now, that's probably overblown and, and a caricature. I want you to look at, I want to make my business more profitable. And I want to do that not through brute force you know, grinding out more hours, but by making smarter decisions about who we market to, how we market, where we market, to bring in the right people so that for the same amount of work, I make more money. And then I can make the decision, maybe to even work a little bit less, putting my attention at other places with the business so that I can bring in some other people who can do some more of that work and I can keep growing it step by step by step by step with that. All right, cool. So now let's go one more place here that I, I did with Brian and I want to share one more piece here. Um, I hope this is good stuff for you. I mean, my goal here uh, in this podcast, when, when we started a short while ago, the, the Business Coach Podcast, our, our, the frame that we said was, you know, I was talking with Kurt who runs our, our marketing side. I was talking with our executive team and the frame for it has been how can I pretend that you and I are one-to-one -one and I'm coaching directly with you? And I'm going to use that through case studies of actual clients that we're coaching, the challenges they're dealing with, and how we coach them through that so that you can apply their situations. Um, I'm also going to be bringing in at various times our, our coaching staff to share their best practice. Because here's the thing. Coaches, we, we are able to, to do really amazing things with client businesses, not just because we're smart. No. The business owners we know, like Brian is smarter than I am by far. He got himself through medical school as a valedictorian. I mean, I'm a, I'm a reasonably bright guy, but you put me in medical school, I'm not going to be the valedictorian like Brian. He is smarter. Objectively, he is smarter, higher IQ. What's the advantage I have in him business than him? Number one, I've had years and years of training in the business side by doing running companies, whereas him through his medical experience, I mean, he probably spent, I don't know what it would be, I'm guessing, eight years, 12 years in, in, in post-college medical school, residencies, uh, and other types of programs because he was a surgeon, right? It, it, it's got to be at least eight years. Probably it's 10 or 12 after his, his undergraduate degree was done. I, I certainly didn't do that. And during that time, I asked so many different people in the medical world, how much time did they give you in medical school about running a practice in terms of the business side? And all of them just kind of go and cringe. And they say zero, not even one class at one day in one class, never. Zero. The second advantage we have is that I get to look at a thousand different businesses. And so what I've learned to do is I've learned to, to create shortcuts that help me get a client better results fast with less work. And so, for example, even just how to, to think about, like, with their lead flow, remember I shared with you the gold standard is to look at the gross profit margin per lead source. Well, most of the clients that I was originally coaching years ago, 20 years ago, they didn't have that that they didn't have that financial information done. So then we can do things like, well, hang on. If what they're producing for each of these different types of tactics are the same, then we can just look at revenue per sale, and that gives us a good enough approximation on profitability per marketing tactic. It's a, it's a cheat sheet. It's, it's unfair, right? 
because it's easy and it gives us a good result, but it, the only reason I know it is because I've had exposure to lots of businesses and over time I've developed, as have our other coaches, these little heuristics, these little shortcuts that make it easier for us to get a result with a client. And then the last one, the one to five, we've been doing that now for 10, 12 years as a way to take something that's really, really fuzzy and to give some precision to it. It's not perfect, it's an approximation. So the last piece of advice that I gave to, to Brian here was, look, he's gonna come up with some ideas. The first mistake that he is at risk to make is to, to do this calculation, get depressed about it, and then just say, screw it, I'm just gonna keep doing it and go back to doing my surgeries. I'm gonna let it go. That, I see that happen. You know, the first person looks at this and they think to himself, this feels like too much work. I'm not going to do it. Not realizing that before he started doing this work, he was working five days a week to make a certain amount of money. Now he's working four days a week to, to make a little bit more money. That's a good thing, right? That's a really, he's 20 plus percent more profitable. His life is smoother than that. He's got more time for his kids with that, more time for his passions, which he's an extreme athlete, right? He liked to do pretty, pretty cool um, physical stuff, stuff that I, I wouldn't be able to do um, in any way. The second mistake they make is they think, oh, I'm gung-ho, I'm gonna fix all this. And the first place they go to fix is their loser. Don't fix your loser, get rid of your loser. Cut it, starve your losers. Take the freed up energy and put it not to both, but to your one clear winner. And now you say, David, I have two clear winners. Okay, well, if you have two clear winners, be smart. Pick one that you do really well is almost always gonna give you a better result than to partially do two things. Simplify, do one of them really well, get that working. Now I'm gonna go one more piece with this, is how do we escape feast or famine? Remember we talked about that early on? How do we escape feast or famine? And to escape feast or famine, it's actually both easier um, and more profitable for you to do. It's easier to do than to run it how you've always been done. But here's how we escape feast or famine. Here's what causes feast or famine. So feast happens because the owner of a middle stage level two business is focuses on marketing, business development, bringing in more business until they're so overwhelmed with that new business that they stop and now they go back down into famine until the owner panics and he or she starts to say, okay, we better put some more energy into our business development and marketing and they come back to feast. And this cycle repeats itself. So how do we, how do, we do that? I, I used to think it was, oh, all we need to do is systematize your marketing, right? So that, that it's not, that there's always, even during times of feast, there's a base level of marketing going on. And that's a good thing. So for example, uh, uh, you know, if one of your tactics that you found was important for you was SEO, um, making sure that you're always doing two, three, four articles per month of solid SEO rich content that's going on your website, right? That might be an example. But doing that as a systematic way. And that was a good bit of advice. But what I discovered as a coach, that it was not the best advice. The best advice for a middle stage level two business is we've got to get the owner out of that baseline marketing. Why? Because owners are notorious that once they hit the feast part, they get so wrapped into the doing, they forget to do the baseline things that keep their baseline marketing going. So yes, I do want baseline marketing systems. That's critical but we've got to change it from where the owner no longer owns doing them, and now they're coming over to be owned by some other person in the business. Now, here's the cool thing. For most level two middle stage businesses, those baseline marketing things don't require a marketer. They just require somebody who's consistently doing some of the basic activities, you know, calling to set up the lunch and learns, or um, uh, making sure that um, at different professional functions that there's a table set aside for your practice, or if you're uh, uh, an accounting firm, you know, and one of your marketing tactics is uh, the things that you do at the local chamber, making sure someone's there every month for the chamber meeting um, to do that. Or if it's your online part and you're working with a third party company, someone's in charge of making sure that every week they're looking at what that outside marketing firm is doing to keep them on track. And when things are going off the rails, somebody raises their hand and says, hang on, we need to look at this closer right away versus two, three, four, six months later. I'll get into more of that in the next episode of this podcast. But my point being, the owner, they're notoriously inconsistent. And, and I've, I mean, this is true over a thousand owners I've coached. There's a subset, 10, 15% of the owners, who could keep this really consistent. 
But if that was the owner who would keep it consistent, this is what their pattern looks like. They go from feast to feast to feast until they run out of operational capacity. We help them solve their operational capacity challenge, and then they go to the next level. They don't have famine. The, the business owners who are really consistent with that part, that 10 or 15%, wonderful. They end up going from feast to feast to feast, but they have to jump through and create more capacity at each of these jumps. But it's true of 85 to 90% of the people I've coached, and this is over 25 plus years, that they're inconsistent with this part. They get wrapped into producing when they're busy, stop doing the marketing. So what we need to do is we need somebody else to own the marketing, even if the the owner of the business is responsible for a piece or two. So for example, let's say that one of the best things you do is you post um, short videos up on Facebook and Instagram and that brings you lots of business. And you're the main spokesperson for your company. And what you normally do, you're posting two, three times uh, a week and that's working really well. But then you get busy and you start posting two or three times a month and so the business dries down. So we say, well, David, how do I have somebody else own that? I mean, it's me on the video. Here's how you do that. You, you turn to Angie, who is the person in, in your staff that you've now said, Angie, you own this, um, our online videos. Here's the system for how we've done it. We've trained you with them. Now, you can't make the video, so here's the key. You manage me. I work for you, and the deliverable I owe you is a minimum of two times a week I need to give you a video. So here's what I'm going to ask. Every week, you make sure you schedule a 15 minute time with me where you'll have the, the video room all set up you know, with, our, with uh, one of the ring lights on there and the stand with our phone on there um, with the microphones. We have better sound quality already. And you own that and you need to make sure that I know the day before you bring me in. I will do the video. Then you own the editing, the posting, all that. And if I ever miss one of those sessions, here's what I'm asking for you to do. I'm asking for you to call me to the mat. You hold me accountable. And if I don't do it more, if I miss more than one time, here's the email address for my Maui business coach. You tell her, and then she'll get on my case. She'll give me that accountability. Right? We're making a little bit of fun with it. But if you do it that way, number one, it takes a lot less of you. Number two, somebody else there is the driver, which will make sure it consistently happens. Because most of the marketing at a middle stage level two company, it's not intricate. It's simple stuff. It's simple stuff that's easy to, to do, but it's easy to stop doing. And then it's easy to do again, and it's easy to stop doing again. And we need to make sure that you keep a base level going. So I hope you've enjoyed this um, episode of The Business Coach. And, and if I got a little bit too excited, I apologize. It's just this stuff, it matters, and I actually find it a lot of fun too. So I'll see you next week in the next episode. I really wish you the best of luck applying what you've learned. Bye-bye.